All right, good morning. So this Sunday after a busy Christmas season on December 24th and 25th, I, I call this Youth Pastor Sunday. <laughs> uh, though I'm not the youth pastor, but in smaller churches, the youth pastor usually preaches after the pastor has a busy week. And then one of the staff pastors gets to preach after the lead pastor has a busy Christmas season. So I'm sorry that you're stuck with me. My name is Jeff Falkowski. I work in the area of, of family ministry here at the church, and I am delighted to be with you as we approach the new year. Amen? Amen? Yeah. But I want to I start off and read our text today. Very well-known passage of scripture if you've been involved in the church for a period of time. So let's take a look at the book of Luke. It's going to be chapter 18. We'll start in verse 9 and go through verse 14. I'm reading out of the ESV. I do prefer this particular passage in the ESV over the NIV. Um, I'll tell you about that later. But for now, let's look at the, let's look at the text. Let us open our ears and hear the word of the Lord. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Dr. Youssef asked me to preach this Sunday on December 31st, I sought the Lord and about what to preach on, and, and this, this text actually just dropped right in my heart. And honestly, I, I, was, I was disappointed. I was like, I, I don't want to preach. This is, this, is not, this is very straightforward. Jesus interprets this right off the get-go. I mean, what, there's not a whole lot to say. I mean, this, this text is about not trusting in our own righteousness and, and cautioning us that when we do trust in our own righteousness, what we do is we end up despising others. We end up looking down upon others because they're not as righteous as we are. Easy, sermon done, y'all can go home, have a great day. <laughs> but as I was getting into the, uh, the, the text and I was reading it and praying over it and chewing on it and preparing it, I felt the weight uh, uh, of what this really means. And I realized that this text is actually focused on us, church people, and how deceptive and beguiling and absolutely destructive self-righteousness it, it imprisons us it, it destroys our lives it destroys our witness it it steals from us haven't you ever found yourself on that place before where you're trusting in the grace of god you're resting in his righteousness. You're resting in his love, his mercy, his kindness to you. You're putting your full hope and, and your, your trust in that and then you start doing good, <laughs> right? And you notice it. I'm doing good. Look at me. Am I the only one in this room that struggles with that? It's the original sin, is it not? Adam said, hey God, I don't need you. I got this. Right? And then we start looking down upon others. And so there's two people I think about that could possibly be here today or, or watching online today that, that might be 
impacted by this. The first is the, is the churchgoer who's never, ever really believed the gospel, has never really put their full hope in the mercy and the grace and the kindness of God in Jesus Christ. And they've sought out to live a good life and they've put their full faith in Christ. They've never been born again. They've never been transformed by his power. That's one person I, I feel the weight of today. The other person is the person that's like me. The person that, that has experienced the grace of God, that has trusted in his mercy, that has found him or herself in that place of just being free in Christ, knowing his great love, that there's nothing we can do to earn it. And we just, all we have to do is rest in it. And when we're free, that way we truly can freely love our neighbors because we don't have to. <laughs> we get to, right? You see the difference? And so you find yourself in that place after that where you, you put layer upon layer upon layer upon what it means to be a good Christian. Oh, I read my Bible, I go to church, I go to Bible study, I know theology, I share the gospel with people, I feed the poor. Look at all these things I do and pretty soon you put your trust in that rather than Christ. And pretty soon you start looking down on other people. And you start thinking you're better than them. And that's what's going on here, you know? The biggest obstacle for you and I living in such a way where we truly love God and truly love our neighbor, the biggest obstacle to that is, to, is that we trust in ourselves rather than in Christ. And it will kill us. And it will strangle our faith. And maybe you're here today, you're tired, you're weary, you're worn out. And maybe the reason is, is because you are on the treadmill of do, do, do. And every New Year's Eve, a large portion of us take a look at our lives and we look at the last year of doing and realize we didn't do enough and we're, <laughs> we feel helpless, don't we? But rather than throwing ourselves at God's mercy, what do we do? I'm going to pull myself up by, by bootstraps and I'm going to do more next year. You know why people get so depressed at this time of year? Because we're not resting in the finished work of Christ. So lean in for a minute. It's not about human doing. It's about human being. Let us be someone this year in 2024 who is fully and completely resting in the mercy and the kindness and the grace of God that he has given us in our Lord Jesus Christ through what he has done to pay our sins on our behalf. Amen. Let's lean into that this year. And when we truly lean in that, then we can truly come to that space where we can, out of the abundance of Christ, love our neighbor well. Amen? Amen. That's what's happening. Jesus tells this story. What a, what a beautiful story it is. But mind you, notice this, because Luke puts this story in his gospel, we have a little insight, don't we? We already know who the bad guy is. <laughs> but the bad guys don't know who they are in this text, do they? When Jesus speaks, he speaks to those who are trusting in their own righteousness, right? And they're, because of that, they're looking down on other people. I can tell you this right now. Here is a perfect litmus test for you and I to know whether we're trusting in our own righteous or not, righteousness or not. It's when we look down on others. Anybody else who's been created in the image of God, when we start thinking we're better for any other reason, and we're not better for any reason, the only difference between us and anybody else is that we have the blood of Christ and our hope and desire is that they will have the blood of Christ too. Amen? Amen. Amen. So he tells this story. And these, these Pharisees, mind you, they were good people, weren't they? Now I know you're saying, how can you say that, Jeff? Well, I mean, I've read the Bible and they aren't seen as very good people, but remember... Joseph of Arimathea, who is the one who provided a grave for Jesus, was a Pharisee. Uh -huh. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus in the night, was a Pharisee. I mean, these folks, were, they were good religious folk. I mean, they, they, they went to temple. They showed up during the times of prayer each day. 
They were teachers in the synagogues. Jesus said that they were diligent students of the scripture. Right? They, they gave alms to the poor. They tithed. They, they did what the law said. They, up, they held the word of God high. So much so that they created additional rules so they wouldn't violate the law of God. Sounds to me like a good evangelical Christian today. They shared their faith. Jesus said, you travel over land and sea to make one convert. So they were evangelistic. They, they had a passion for the lost. And so when the, he's telling about this prayer, immediately they're thinking to themselves, well, if you're going to talk about a Pharisee and a tax collector, the Pharisee is going to be the guy that's going to be the one we want to be like. Then you have the Sadducees, right? They were the mainline Jews of the day. They didn't necessarily believe in the resurrection. They weren't looking forward to a Messiah like the Pharisees were. But they, they thought the law of Moses would be good for their culture. They thought that the religious traditions were good for their culture. Kind of like a mainline church today. Then you have the Heridians, right? Think of the Heridians. You know who the Heridians were? These were the socially progressive. These were the progressives politically. They thought, let's, let's hang out with Rome. Let's, we, we were going to be Hellenized Jews. We, we want to we stay up with the, what's hip in culture. So, but the worst of the worst of the worst of these people were the tax collectors. I went to reread an old book that I have by a guy named Everett Ferguson called Early Backgrounds of Christianity. And it basically said that tax collectors were informers. So here you have somebody who's of your religion and of your nationality who's going to the enemy and basically informing them that you're not paying for your own subjugation. <laughs> Imagine their position in society. They're traitors. They're snitches. You've heard the, you've heard the term snitches get? Stitches. Stitches. Right on. I'm glad, I'm glad we know what that means. And so... That's, that's, that's their position in culture of that day. Do you see, I think you hear what I'm trying to say. If this text is speaking to anybody, it's speaking to me. It's speaking to us. You know, the, the tax collector would be somebody that would be so far different from us today. It, it, it might be somebody that might work for Planned Parenthood. That's what the tax collector might be. I'm, tr I'm not saying that, that, I'm not trying to make an equivocation so much so as trying to get us to understand what that person would be like to, in our mind to the good religious folks of the day, right? Somebody that's against us and against our message. Who's gonna have the better prayer? I wanna talk about the, the good, the bad, the ugly and the beautiful. Let's, let's look at, let's look at there's, there's actually some really good things in here where Jesus says, the Pharisee standing by himself. The NIV says praying about himself or praying to himself. Now, I read John Calvin and we respect John Calvin in this church and John Calvin says that he was actually praying silently so that's actually a good thing, isn't it? Because Jesus actually said, don't be like the hypocrites who stand up in the synagogue so that they're seen. Don't go on the, on the corner, pray loud and long prayers to be heard by men. This guy's just kind of praying a prayer to himself, so that's a good thing, right? He's not necessarily trying to show off. And the second thing he does is he, he starts off by thanking God. I thank you, God. Isn't that a good way to start prayer? with thankfulness. And even John Calvin again says that he is acknowledging the grace of God in his life and that's something we should do in prayer. But then he says something and I want to kind of put this off to the side for a moment. He says something that is a little peculiar that I'm not like other men. Let's just put that statement over there and I'll come back to it and we'll pull it off the shelf in just a minute. But 
It's up over here, okay? But he goes on to say something. He goes on to say, these are, are these not good things? I thank you that I'm not an extortioner. I don't rob. I don't use my power to take, take from other people. I, I'm not an extortioner. I'm not a robber. I'm not a thief. I'd like this guy to be on my HOA. Sometimes I look at that HOA budget and I'm wondering where those funds are going. Right? I'm not unjust. I mean, he cares about justice. He cares about the poor. He cares, he cares about the social issues of the day. He cares about the widow, the alien, the stranger among them. That's what justice was, biblical justice. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I care about my wife. I'm faithful to her. I'm a family guy. We need good, strong families. The Hebrews, above all people, had a very high value and view of the family. I'm not like this tax collector. I'm, I'm not a traitor. I'm not disloyal to my people. I'm keeping things real. This guy's pretty good. You see, those are good things, right? I'd want this guy to join my church. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I, I would want him to be my next door neighbor. I know he'd cut his grass. <laughs> I would want him to be a teacher. The Pharisees were teachers. They often taught in synagogues. I mean, this, this guy would be a, a great candidate for church leadership based on what we said. But let's look at the bad. Because we kind of get an uneasy, uneasy feeling when we read this text, don't we? A little bit. Especially when he says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. Especially that guy over there. You ever go to church and be like, <laughs> look at that guy. <laughs> look at that girl. How come they're raising their hands? How come they're not raising their hands? Hello. <laughs> Friends, self-righteousness is so subtle. So subtle. You see, the problem is, is that this Pharisee thinks that these practices that he should be doing, that we should be doing, right, make him better than other people. And the reality of it is, is that he comes to a point where he's trusting in his performance and not God's grace. Not God's grace. What an amazing statement when he says, I'm not like this tax collector. No, he's not. He's trusting in his own righteousness. He's trusting in himself. You see, listen, uh, here's the thing, friends. He comes to a space where he, it just gets ugly because he comes to a space where he thinks that he doesn't need a savior. He doesn't recognize that he's a sinner, right? I mean, he comes to a place where he actually says that he does even more than the law requires. I fast twice a week. The law does not require that. I give all that I get of my tithes. I do more than the law asks me to do. And he thinks he's super righteous in the sight of God because he's comparing himself with others rather than standing before God, recognizing who he is in it before a holy God. Amen. You know, God is a holy, righteous, perfect, kind, good, loving God. And because of sin, we have fallen far short of what God requires of of us and there's nothing, 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 nothing that you and I can do except appeal to the mercy and the grace of God. You see, is not self-righteous subtle? Is not that the human heart to be self-righteous? I mean, even in the world of people who, who don't know Christ, especially we see this, we see things like 
ecolog ecological righteousness, right? Don't we see that today? It's all about saving the earth. And we should care about the earth as Christians. We've been given a creation mandate to care for creation. But it doesn't make us any better than all, anybody else. We, we have social issue righteousness today. And we, we have elevated ourselves, but based on what social issue we are championing, right? We have denominational righteousness. We have theological tradition righteousness. And by golly, we have green thumb righteousness. You're like, what's green thumb righteousness? Well, I'll tell you what green thumb righteousness is. I'll never forget a time when I was living in Mableton, my first tour of duty here at Church of the Apostles in the early 2000s. I left and I came back, by the way. And I was living in this neighborhood and we were going to have a backyard Bible study club for kids. And so in preparation for that, I was going to make the yard look absolutely fantastic. And I got up in the morning and I pulled hoses out because my neighbors, they had irrigation systems, not me. And Jeff Olkowski, the good Polak, was willing to get up at five o'clock in the morning and move those hoses and make that lawn look beautiful and trim those bushes and put out that fresh pine straw and plush, fresh, put those fresh flowers up. And I'll never forget a guy named Charles Height who goes to this church, came to my house that night and he goes, man, your yard looks good. And I said, yeah, it sure does, doesn't it? <laughs> you know I do it, don't you? I want to be a good witness to my neighbors <laughs> as if my yard's going to save their soul. And Charles looked at me and he said, Jeff, it sounds to me like you've got a serious case of green thumb righteousness. <laughs> so you ever see a balloon and a little pinprick in it? I was the balloon. Charles was the pinprick. <laughs> this passage should be a pinprick in the balloon of ourself righteousness. We talked about the good. We talked about the bad. We talked about the ugly. The ugly being in a space where you come to that place where you don't need a savior. But friends, I want to say one more thing. Don't you remember that time when you first met Christ and you felt so free? And his love just permeated your heart and you just loved people? Not because you had to, but because the love of Christ was just flowing in your heart and out of your heart? And it didn't matter how much they read their Bible or what church they went to or whether or not they were witnessing or they were helping the poor. All you really did is you just loved people because they were created in God's image and you felt no better than them based on you doing those behaviors you were just somebody who found the bread of life and you wanted to give them the bread of life too. Amen. Right? Remember that time? And then self-righteousness can creep in. How do we mitigate against that? Let me challenge you to, to see this prayer of this tax collector where he comes before the Lord and we need to come before the Lord daily like this and stand before him and pound our chest in recognition of our need for Christ and his goodness in our lives. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because that's what we are. And we need a Savior. And our Savior is Jesus Christ. Amen. And Christ is for you, for the forgiveness of sins through, through faith, which is, a which is a gift. It's all gift. It's all God. And all we need to do is say, Yes, Lord, I receive your free gift. 
you great gift giver, and there's nothing I can do to earn it. You know the amazing thing to me? Is that the scripture doesn't tell us whether or not this tax collector went away and spent time trying to reform his life. It doesn't say he went out and afterwards he repented and he read his Bible, he prayed, he went to synagogue, he stopped being a tax collector. It doesn't say any of that. It doesn't need to. You want to know why? Because when we get new roots in Christ, if we're rooted in Christ, in the soil of Jesus Christ, the fruit will come. It's not based on us. It's based on Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Sanctifier. He is the Perfector. Put your full faith and trust in Christ and Him alone each and every day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray we rest in Christ in 2024. Amen. Amen.